Hello everyone, this is Dr. Emily Sharning with American Resiliency here with an up-to-date climate outlook for all of our friends in Virginia. You might have seen we did Maryland's updated outlook a few weeks ago, and I feel like those two states, you guys are so connected, I couldn't leave Virginia's outlook undone for long. Big picture for your state, we're looking at a range of change in climate, with some of it honestly looking really good, but we do have to face the reality of some serious challenges, especially near the coast. A little background for this update. When I founded American Resiliency in 2021 and started making these climate outlooks, I called them 2050 climate forecasts. Back then, it seemed reasonable to think that we'd hit 2C regularly starting around mid-century. That was the consensus science. But that was then. In 2023, as you know from having lived, it was a very serious year in climate. And I want to share this figure from the Copernicus Institute. That's a high-value source. That's the EU's climate people. You can see here, we hit 2C for a couple of days towards the end of 23, and we were around 2C for quite a few days there in February. The March numbers aren't on this figure, but according to the Copernicus Institute, our March average was 1.68C above pre-industrial baseline. So we are not yet headed in a good direction here. I would say that information, it ought to force us to change our thinking. So this outlook, it's a 2C outlook, and as far as the timeline goes, Seems like we're all going to find that one out. So let's check the challenge level for Virginia at 2C. Just so you know where to find my source material, this forecast is based on the National Climate Assessment. This was just updated in November of 23. And if you want to follow along with me, go to Chapters and hit All Figures. You'll find that you can download all the figures there so that you can look at them offline. I'll also sometimes be using information from the NCA Atlas. You can see that'll open a new window and you'll want to go down and check out climate maps and open the Explorer. That way you can follow along yourself there as well. We're using the fifth national climate assessment as a primary source because it represents the highest consensus climate science available. Your tax dollars paid for the development and review of this document, and you deserve access to this information. But as a matter of congressional mandate, there's no direct funding for communication to the public about the national climate assessment. That made me so mad I founded American Resiliency, we're the only nonprofit focused on communicating this important information directly to the public, and we run on your donations. Checking out our first figure, 1.14, as we narrow in on Virginia's outlook, we see that Virginia is smack in the middle of this moderate change band here. That means you're expecting a total heat up around the year of 4 to 5 degrees F, which we'll get into what that means in terms of where it's going to fall around the year. But being right in the middle of a change band is usually a pretty good place to be. That usually means you've got a relatively low rate of change. So I'm optimistic as we look for more details. Here in figure 2.11, where we're looking at changes to hot and cold extremes, we can see where that change is likely to fall around the year. And man, even at first glance, that is some nice low change territory in Western Virginia. Look at that pale band, low change, fairly low rate of winter change, Low rate of change in warm nights around that western edge of Virginia looks fabulous at a glance. Let's dig in. Let's build our understanding of what this change is going to be for the summers, because that looks fairly serious as we get near the coast. Virginia, I think you benefit from a side-by-side -side here. So this is SNPs from figure 2.11, your projected increase in days over 95, and your projected increase in nights over 70. There's a clear line there where you're preserving the cold and it doesn't take a genius to see what it is, right? I love it when I can see mountains hold the cold, when we see a good preservation of elevation dependent cool summers, because let me tell you, they don't always hold it as well as you might like. I just processed and released the Arizona outlook last week. We actually saw warming amplified in the mountains there. That was really sad, but your mountains look awesome. Towards the coast, though, that does look sweaty enough, especially with that big increase in nights over 70, like a month of additional nights over 70. Let's do a high temp check. Let's get over to the atlas. So I'm over in the NCA5 atlas here looking and change in number of days over 100 at 2C. It's really important to know that the NCA5 resources for days over 95, over 100, and over 105 don't stack automatically. If you want to see hot days at a glance, your total days over 95 going way out there at a glance, you need to look at Dustin's total heat map. This is a volunteer-made resource for AR that sums those stacks. You can see here that for many counties in Virginia at 2C, we're looking 
at more than 20 additional days over 95. And for your hottest counties right there in the coastal plain, we're looking at a potentially hidden increase of about five additional days over 100. So if you got 24 additional days over 95, might be 19 of them are 95 to 100, about five days, 100 to 105. So pulling all that information together for those hottest coastal counties in Virginia, you're looking at a four-week increase in your hot season, about three weeks more over 95. The fourth week, the summer peak, mostly below 105. We're looking at maybe one day over 105 a summer for those hottest coastal counties. And that's kind of a shocker to see. That's very Louisiana-like but it's a survivable outlook. Even the parts of Virginia that are getting the hottest, I see that temp increase. I think we can build resilience here. I think that this is okay. The daytime heat increase is about what I would expect from that level of warm night increase, a full additional month where it's over 95 during the day and it doesn't cool off below 70 at night. If you are in this darkest colored area on this map here, you're facing the most severe increases in extreme heat in Virginia. I think there is potential concern for wet bulb temperatures, but only for a very few number of days per year. Overall, hopeful in terms of potential and capacity to build resilience. As we move out of this zone, we're talking more like a three-week summer extension. Even here in this hot spot, you don't overlay as much with a warm night hot spot, so I'm not as concerned about you. Once we get up in the mountains, we're talking about just a handful additional days over 95. No really terrifying, no worrisome increase in summer heat once you get up in elevation. Returning to the full version of figure 2.11, let's talk winter. Let's zoom in and see what we can take from here. We're talking about losing either about four weeks below freezing or three weeks below freezing in that lighter colored area. So we know we're looking at a shorter duration winter. Let's look at intensity of winter change in figure 11.3. So this figure lets us look at changes in winter lows, changes in winter intensity based on changes in plant hardiness zones. And I know that this is too big. We're gonna look at some SNPs in a minute so that we can get some actual information out of here. But I'm gonna look at our present day climate normals and a 2C projection. I just want you to see that 3C data is also available if you wanna go in and learn more yourself. So in this side-by-side, -side, I think this is quite interesting. You can see that for much of the state, you've got a straight up five degree projected lift in winter lows. That's not too bad. Good news for mature plants. That winter stability is very important for mature plants like adult trees. But you do have some higher change pockets. And let's focus in on those pockety areas. As we can see, all around the 81 here, all along running up that ridge of the mountains there, We've got some towns with a little bit higher change than others, but it looks like the worst you're facing is a 10 degree jump in your winter lows. And the majority of towns are looking at just a one zone jump, just a five degree lift in their winter lows. That's looking really good. And I love to see that. Just to take a note at a highlighted area of low change right here, falling into Virginia, there's this lower change area around the Monongahela forest. And I know that a lot of folks in this area, you feel a lot of kinship and love for that forest. I think it's nice and powerful to see the way that this forest is also really loving us back. The level of protection that we see around here is not entirely elevation dependent. As we look at information coming in from all over the U.S., I think that it's worth continuing to nurture this forest. The fire risk is really low. We're over in the wane here. It looks pretty high, actually. It's nice to see a thing working out for people here in both West Virginia and Virginia. I'm very hopeful about this whole area in terms of total change. Towards the coast, I do want to point out we're seeing a South Carolina alert right here. If we look at this dark color moving in, that's new to the area. Looking at the plant hardiness zone moving in that today we see in South Carolina and sort of the northern coast of Georgia, that's a big winter change to face, but let's take a minute. I feel like it's not worth freaking out because if you think about the cities that are there, like Savannah, Georgia, that's a known winter destination. Everybody likes that area in winter. So it's a high change you're facing towards the coast, but it doesn't have to be terrible. You are in a position where you're facing a lot of change, but you've got a climate analog. You can go and see what the southern coast of Virginia could look like in terms of new habitats and ecosystems. We can get the plants. We could do the work. It is a big change. 
But if you put it next to your summer change, I feel like you're really building a picture where coastal Virginia, particularly on the southern edge of the state, is turning into a climate that is very much like Savannah, Georgia's today. And that's a lot to take in, but I don't know. It's not as bad as it could be. We're looking at survivable change into a relatively pleasant climate. I am much more concerned about the rates of change faced in coastal Massachusetts and New York City than I am about you. Coastal Virginia, I think you got a good shot, especially considering what the region as a whole is up against. So these are some big changes to the seasons we're looking at in the coastal plain, the nearer you get to the coast, and relatively small changes to the seasons up in the mountains. Let's see what the water outlook is going to be. That'll make it easier to envision what's going to happen as we see these changes come to the state. In figure 210, which is where I usually start with the water outlook, that's a bit subtle where we see those precipitation patterns shifting in Virginia. Let's see if a different model gives us a clearer view. Let's go look at figure 4.3. All right, I do actually think that this is very useful. Here we can see that some parts of Virginia are looking at more like three additional inches of precipitation, some just another inch. Really, that's pretty nice here. I don't think that you necessarily want a huge amount more rain in this part of the mountains, especially because you're not seeing a substantial increase in days over 95. For most of the state, we're talking about maybe an inch, maybe two inches of additional rain per year. So that's going to be useful as we're dealing with increasing heat. That means we're likely not to see any sort of desertification happening with that warming trend near the coast leaves you the possibility of positive landscape change. Let's see if these storms are going to be coming in big deluge type rains or not. We can get kind of a peek at that if we look over at figure 2.12. This is another one of those complex figures and I screen what are the repeating patterns across all three models and we do see some fairly good news here in terms of repeating patterns for Virginia. In this area where we had highest temperature change, we see a sign not of deluge type rains, a sign of decreases in your five-year max, which you may have noticed have been creeping up the last five years. So this is a good sign. This is a sign for relatively gentle rain, not deluge type rain on this more vulnerable highest change part of the state. I'm glad you're not getting hit by everything at once, you know? There is one conserved hot spot for deluge. It's just a little bit north of Harrisonburg, right around here. Well, we do see more water coming in your storms, and we're talking about maybe 15% more water per storm in those darker regions. That's no joke. You got to prepare for that. I was concerned you were going to get hammered worse. We do see worse, um, more intense storm threats in some parts of Appalachia. But the threat here, except for that one hotspot, is pretty even across the state. And it's great news that from Richmond to Norfolk to Virginia Beach, we do see that reduced potential for really serious storms. Norfolk, I know you've got enough water troubles, and let's move into that. Let's start talking about sea level rise. In figure 9.2, we see the feds have you projected to hit about two feet of sea level rise by 2050, but I think we also need to model 10 feet in case of AMOC collapse. You know, even in 22, very few mainstream climate scientists would have raised AMOC collapse as an alarm, but we have a number of alarm bells ringing pretty loud that we could see a major change in ocean currents in the next five to 10 years. That would accelerate melting in Antarctica, which we are observing happening now, and lead to much more substantial sea level rise, talking about like 13 feet global of sea level rise. We're using NOAA's sea level rise viewer as we explore sea level rise, and let's actually start pretty well inland here. Let's look at Richmond. So in Richmond and in Fredericksburg, we don't expect like transformative change if we see two feet of sea level rise. But if we got 10 feet, we would be looking at a broader waterway with some impacts, particularly in industrial areas where that would have to be cleaned up if you don't want to have a pollution incident that really disturbs the potential of having a broader, more usable waterway. Taking a second to look at Fredericksburg, you can see even at two feet closer towards the ocean, we see tremendous expansion of the waterway, which could impact the soil, could get some saltwater incursion into the soil of this rich agricultural area. When we look at 10 feet, we see that the new margins for the waterway are pretty stable. And just like down in Richmond, we see some incursion of that expanded waterway moving into town, 
with moderate damage to areas immediately adjacent. You can see most of the housing stock is fine, but that even far inland like this, far inland like in Fredericksburg, if we see AMOC collapse, it's worth taking resilience measures to prepare. I wanted to talk about that first because I think that that part of the sea level rise threat for our inland cities is often not strongly considered enough. People are aware, I think, in Virginia that the current situation down here in Chesapeake Bay is already changing dramatically due to sea level rise. That at two feet, we expect to see a lot of land lost from sea level rise and that much of it is important wildlife habitat. And a lot of it is also where people live. I mean, look at this. With another two feet, we see extreme marshiness coming in around this entire developed area. And at 10 feet, like, what can you do? There's only so much you can do before you have to accept that this area appears to be being reclaimed by the sea. This is a massive amount of incursion where we see serious marshiness even in remaining land masses. And you may know, Norfolk has done a lot of work to publicize the threat of sea level rise due to the military involvement there and the fact that their facilities are being impacted. We've seen a lot of research come out of this area around how to deal with sea level rise, about building living shorelines, about managed coastal retreat, even with the great work that's been done here. If we're talking about a high rise scenario, it is very difficult to see how this is not going to impact thousands of American families in a very direct and painful way related to loss of their property value. If you're in one of these vulnerable areas of coastal Virginia, you really ought to consider if you want to be here for this or if you want to get out before there's a total collapse in home values. I know home values are already starting to be impacted in this particular region. I think it is important to note, zooming out, that these highly impacted regions are fairly conserved and that as you get a bit further north, topography really changes. And even historic areas, like we see in Williamsburg here, we see very little direct impact on most of your housing stock or built environment due to the fact that the plane isn't lying so low. It's not so gently going into the ocean there. So if you're anywhere near coastal Virginia, I would get onto that NOAA tool. The link is in the video description. Put in your address and see what the direct threat is. You might be pleasantly surprised because even in a catastrophic sea level rise scenario, there are a lot of coastal Virginia properties that look to be undamaged, much better than the Maryland outlook actually in terms of proportion. However, this is important when we're looking at a threat of this size, even if you're well away from the coast. In terms of direct threats to communities and human well-being, there's a lot of fairly good conserved territory in Virginia. However, the cost to the state of all this sea level rise stuff is going to be really serious. Financially, I'm not sure how the state or how our nation will handle it. It's hard to imagine this level of damage not impacting other parts of the budget. In states that are highly impacted by sea level rise, I do advise thinking through some things before you decide what your plan's going to be as we look at this challenging future. If you're anywhere near the coast, you should look up information on your local water table. What's going on with your water and sewer utilities? You know, look into it. Find out if sewage outputs would be overtopped under projected rise scenarios. Learn about where your drinking water comes from. If your water table is already pretty high, if your utilities are likely to be impacted, Think about how much you trust your local government and utility companies to take care of those issues for you. If your trust levels are low, I get out while it's good. There's not going to be as much money to fix things as there are things that'll need fixing. If you can get any of your local water people to sit down with you informally, I find that those kind of folks are often very willing to give you the straight talk over a beer. From such conversations with utility workers in and around New York City, I can tell you, that a little bit up north there, they're very seriously concerned about those issues and they don't have the funding they say they need to address these problems. Virginia, though, other than the costs of sea level rise, I honestly think that you look pretty good. Just like we saw in that first figure, this is a relatively moderate overall change outlook. If we compare it to Maryland, Maryland, a lot of the historical areas are getting slammed really hard. You're being able to preserve more of the cultural heritage in your state from sea level rise. I think that's a comfort for us. And the level of severe damage from sea level rise is not as widespread as in Maryland. 
you have more coastal territory where resilience is really like, I would go for it due to the relative height of your landscape. As you get north of Virginia, up towards New York, up towards Boston, we see more widespread, more damaging sea level rise issues, especially related to urban environments. But Virginia, you appear to be sitting pretty nice in that change sweet spot where it's really not looking as bad as it could be. And you know, your state, Virginia, been at that dividing line where from the beginning of our nation, you kind of represented the northernmost point of the South, right? If you embrace the ways your coastal plain is becoming more Southern, becoming more like a South Carolina, North Georgia type climate, we've got a good model for how to move forward in the future. The plants are there. The landscape models are there. Maybe we can also learn how to chill out a little bit. An area with major hot season warming like we see, particularly in coastal Virginia, part of building resilience honestly, is looking for opportunities to reduce productivity and activity during the summer hot season. That's a traditional way to live in this kind of emerging climate. It'd be a better way to live in terms of energy use. So that's the coast. But in the mountains, don't let me shortchange you because you look great. I would stay put and build resilience in a very substantial portion of Virginia. It's important to see what the challenges are. In the mountains, you're looking at that deluge type rain. You want to prepare for that. Towards the coast, big temperature changes. Change is coming, but in your case, I think you're in a great position to get ready for that change. The get out regions of Virginia are quite limited. They're exclusively defined by high sea level rise. If you're in them, I know that you already see the writing on the wall. I'm sorry to say that we don't expect things to improve. But overall, Virginia, when we look at your outlook, you absolutely can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready. Folks, thanks so much for your support of American Resiliency. It's thanks to viewers like you who have contributed your energy, your money, your time that we are where we are today, which is off the runway and looking towards year four and five. We're in the middle of a visioning process as we figure out what we want to do with the power that we've accumulated here with AR to figure out what climate information folks need, how to get it to them. If you want to be part of the visioning process, please get in touch. This is inclusive. We're seeking input from everyone in the community. And thanks again. Your involvement keeps this nonprofit going. If you want to give, you can find a donate tab at the top of our webpage or on the about page of our YouTube channel. Thanks so much and talk to you again soon.